In this video, I am going to talk about the most important best practices of an agile framework, which is extreme programming. The short form of extreme programming is XP. Why I am discussing this particular topic? Because my students who passed the PMP exam recently, they have unanimously said, Gautam, understanding of these best practices is very, very, very important considering the current trend of the PMP exam. And most importantly, please watch this video from start to end because at the end of the video, I'm going to practice a question around these best practices. Trust me, the probability of you guys finding the similar question in the actual PMP exam is very, very higher. So let's not waste any time. Let's get right into it. Hey guys, my name is Gautam Sutakar. I'm working as head of training department with EDU HubSpot. So before we start learning these best practices, let's try to understand and uh, overview about XP. As I said, XP means extreme programming. Extreme programming, it's like an agile framework, not it's like an agile framework. It is an agile framework similar to Scrum. And most importantly, extreme programming has 12 best practices, which any software developers can use while they are writing software code. Out of these 12 best practices, in this particular video, I'm going to discuss only four best practices, uh, which are very important for your PMP exam. Uh, you know what, these best practices are more for software, but uh, nevertheless, a uh, lot of product development companies nowadays, they have started using these best practices. But don't worry, in this video, I'm going to explain these four uh, best practices in a very simple language, which everyone can easily relate to. So let's not waste any time. Let's get started. So let me start explaining the first best practice that is pair programming. So what is pair programming? Two people sitting in front of a computer and doing programming together means writing software code together. A person can be named as driver and another person can be named as navigator. Now it's a time to understand the responsibilities of driver and the responsibilities of navigator. Driver is the one who is actually writing the software code. Who is navigator then? What is the responsibility of navigator? Navigator is the one who guide the next steps for the driver. Okay, driver, you have written this line of code. The next step is please write the code for another requirement, something like that. And navigator will do the code review as well. This means while driver writing the code itself, navigator will do the review. So this is pair programming. Now, we have taken a software example and then we have studied pair programming. Now let's try to connect this topic with an another domain example. Let's say a construction example. Consider you're working in a construction company. Your project is to construct an apartment. You are currently designing the living room of an apartment. So here, definitely you can use pair programming. Make two people sit in front of the computer. One person will be a driver. Another person will be a navigator. So what this driver will do? Driver will actually design the living room. So what this navigator will do? Navigator will do the design review. This means while driver designing the living room itself, navigator will do the design review of that particular living room. I hope you guys are getting me because you know this pad programming is actually defined for a software industry, but a lot of other industries have started adapting these practices. Now it's a time to discuss the uh, benefits of pad programming. What are the benefits? See, if you ask me, it eliminate distractions. Consider I am a driver. I am writing the software code. Suddenly, you know, my friends are calling me through my mobile. I won't pick up my mobile because there is a navigator who is uh, sitting behind me. He or she will make sure that I'm focused on writing the code. And the second benefit, it identifies issues earlier. People who are in uh, product development or software development, this is the common practice we'll be following. We will be developing a software. We will be writing the code for the software. After that, code review will happen. 
even in the design area you will be doing a design of a living room let's say and after that design review will happen so normally this is a step that will happen one after another what are the disadvantage of this so once we develop the whole thing we will do a review it is very tough for a reviewer to find mistakes and even though the reviewer is finding mistakes it is very tough for the person who develops the code to correct that mistake this pair programming avoids that because while i am writing the code itself or let's take construction example while i am designing the living room itself a person is reviewing so with that we can identify issues very earlier that is one of the biggest benefits of the pair programming and what is the third benefit constant collaboration will happen this means it's not like uh, a person will be always be paired with an another person permanently this pair will be switched often so with that we can make sure that every team members are making pair with that a constant collaboration is happening and also knowledge sharing is happening we are making sure that on our software or in the construction industry on our design every team members has knowledge with this we are avoiding single point of failure so what is single point of failure one person is having the entire knowledge about the project now let's talk about the typical manager mindset as a manager what we will be thinking you know what team efforts are wasted by making a pair you know two people are implementing one requirement so if i am not making a pair one person can do one requirement whereas another person can do another requirement so that is a typical manager's mindset right so we'll be thinking team efforts are wasted but trust me it is not i'll tell you the reason for that now let me bring one of the benefits i have quoted for pair programming it identifies issues earlier right so that the correction also will be very minimal you don't want to do a very big correction so time is actually not wasted and to be very honest it is not practically possible to do pair programming for uh, all the requirements you are implementing at least try to do this for some important requirements like uh, safety related requirements etc now let's start discussing the next topic which is technical debt and refactoring let me start with technical debt first let's start with the definition what is technical debt extra work you must do because you took a shortcut to speed up the work in past so now as i already stated uh, these things are for software let me start with a software example and let me explain the technical debt and after that i will give you a generic example which everyone can easily relate to now i'm going to use some software language which any software coder or uh, when you have a software coding background you will easily understand sometimes while you're writing a software code for a requirement so what you will do in order to fastly deliver that particular requirement you might not be following coding standards for example you won't write comments in the code and then uh, the variable name you will just give it like temp a b c you won't give a proper name and sometimes you know you will create a duplicate code which can be easily handled with a function when you are doing that that is a debt you are creating but the requirement will work but you have created a debt by not following the coding standards so that is technical debt now let's try to understand what are the disadvantage or i would say what is the main disadvantage when you are creating technical debt you know what you will start resisting changes agile is about embracing change right so you will start resisting changes for example your code is full of technical debt when a customer or any uh, even a product owner asks for changes you will always find hard to change your code because you have not written any comments for example variable name you have just given a random variable name you have created a lot of duplicate codes you know you will start resisting changes because change will become a headache for you that is the main disadvantage when you are creating technical debt now is it okay to create a technical debt you know what even the best programmers are creating technical debt so this means it's okay sometimes you have to fastly deliver a code to a customer or to a product owner for that reason you can create technical debt but you must spend some time to always pay out for the debt right 
So this means you have to spend some time to do refactoring. So what's refactoring? Again, let's start with the definition. Refactoring is the process of improving code structure and readability without changing its external behavior. This means simple, paying out the debt. So whenever time permits, when you have created technical debt, open your code and write comments, for example, and then change the uh, variable name, which logically makes sense. So when you have created some duplicate code, change that and make sure it is handled with a function. So when you're doing that, you have refactored the code. You are cleaning up the code. So this is called technical debt and refactoring. Now, you know, I can literally read uh, the minds of the uh, people who are from non-software. Gautam, I have not understood anything. Now for you, I will give you a generic example so that you can easily relate technical debt and refactoring. So I would like to share one of my personal experiences. Uh, this happened exactly two years before. What happened? I was shifting my home from uh, one place to another place. So whenever we are entering into a new home, one headache task is arranging all the things, right? So that was a headache task. So me and my wife was arranging all the things, you know, in our new home. Uh, my wife gave me a task. My wife told Gautam, this is a cupboard that is allocated for you. Put all your clothes inside. That was a requirement that is given to me. You know what husbands will do? The same thing I did. What I did was I dumped all my clothes inside. It was looking very clumsy, but the requirement is satisfied, right? So my wife told Gautam, put all your clothes inside. I have done that. But what is the debt I have created? I did not properly arrange my clothes. I just dumped. So now can I make any changes over there? For example, when my wife says, Gautam, remove a red t-shirt and replace that with a green t-shirt. I can't do that change. I will start resisting changes. Now what I should do? Whenever time permits, I should do refactoring. What is refactoring means? I have to split my cupboard into three halves. In one half, I will be arranging all my t-shirts. In the other half, I will be arranging all my shirts. In the other half, I will be arranging all my pants. So now a change is happening. For example, my wife is asking, Gautam, remove the red t-shirt and just replace that with a green t-shirt. I can easily do it. So this is called refactoring. Now let's discuss the last best practice, which is TDD. This means test driven development. So now let's try to understand how a normal development process works. It can be a software development or it can be a product development. Let's take software. Consider you'll be writing a software code and after that you will do a testing. Your internal team members will do a testing and they will make sure that the code is working according to the requirement. That is the same case when you are developing a product as well, right? So you will develop a product and after that your internal team members will do testing and then they will find out whether the product is satisfying all the requirements or not. So this is a normal development process. Now, TDD, test driven development will exactly reverse this normal development process. This means you will first write the test case. Mostly it will be an automated test case. And after that, you will write the code or you will develop the product to just to make the test case passed. Still confused? Let's try to understand this test driven development with a practical example and also with a very good flowchart. So the flowchart that you are seeing on my screen, it's a great example for test driven development. If you want to apply this particular practice, so what you guys have to do is first write a test case. Mostly it will be an automated test case and then execute the test. The test will fail because you have not implemented that requirement yet. And after that, what you will do, you will make changes to the code, to your software code, just to make the test passed. After that, you will do a refactoring. Now the requirement is implemented. Now you will execute the test. The test will pass if the code is correct. So this is called test driven development. This means I am writing a test case and that is driving my development. Still confused? Let's understand this flowchart again with a practical example. Okay, the example I'm gonna take is, see my project is to develop a simple calculator application, you know, in the system. Let's take one requirement. The requirement is 
user should be able to do the addition of two numbers. That's a requirement. Kindly understand in my calculator application, this requirement is not yet implemented. So now let me apply test driven development. This means I'm going to use test driven development and then I'm going to develop this requirement. So if I want to use the test driven development, what is the first thing? I have to write the test case. So I'm writing a test case. Test case number one. In the calculator, press button one. I have to press a button one. And I have to press the button plus. And then I have to press button three. And in the calculator application, I have to press button equal to. What should be the resultant number? One plus three, the resultant number should show four. If it is four, the test is passed. If it is any other number, the test is failed. I have written test case number one. I'll show you one more example. For a requirement, you can write multiple test cases. I'm writing another test case for the same requirement. In the calculator, I'm pressing the button like 1.5. Then I'm pressing plus symbol. And then after that, I'm pressing 3.3 .3, and I'm pressing equal to. What should be the resultant number? It should be 4.8 because 1.5 plus 3.3, .3, it is 4.8, right? If it is 4.8, the test is passed. If it is any other number, the test is failed. That's it. Test case is written. After that, what test driven development says, you have to execute the test. So kindly be aware in the calculator application, we are developing the addition requirement is not yet implemented. Now, when you are executing the test, what will happen? Let's say you are opening the calculator application. You are pressing the button one. You will see one. You are pressing the button plus. You will see plus. Now, according to the test case, you are pressing the button 3, you will see 3, but when you are pressing the button equal to, you won't see the resultant 4 because the addition functionality is not yet implemented. The test is failed or not? Yes, it is failed. Similarly, let's take test case 2. You will run this test case 2 as well. You will take your calculator application, you will press 1.5, it will come. You will press plus button, it will come. You will press 3.3, .3, it will come, but when you're pressing equal to, you won't see 4.8. Test will fail because the requirement is not yet implemented. That's it. I executed the test and the test is failed. Now what a software developer will do, the software developer will change the code just to make these two test cases passed. That's it. Nothing else. And after that, the software developer will refactor the code as well. You guys already know what is refactoring. That is something I've already explained. Now they will execute the test because that implementation is already done after changing the code. Now, if I execute the test, what will happen? Let's go to the test case again. I will open the calculated application. In that, I will press one. One will come. I will press plus. Plus will come. I will press three. Three will come. Now, if I press equal to in your calculator application, when the code is correctly implemented, you will see four. Same, I will do for test case two also. I will run the test case two as well. I will press 1.5 plus, and then after that, I will type 3.3. Uh, .3. If I press equal to, if the code is implemented correctly, that calculator application will show me 4.8. Now the test will pass. And this is called test driven development. This means the development which is driven by a test case. Now, you should logically ask me a question. Gautam, what is the advantage of doing test driven development? We can avoid gold plating. So what is gold plating? Implementing some extra requirements that is actually not needed. So for example, here I have clearly written the test case for my calculator application. This means I will know how my end user is going to use my calculator application. I will just write just enough code to make the test cases pass. I will never do gold plating. I won't give any extra features to my customer because that is a waste that you are creating when you are doing gold plating. Along with that, what's happening in test driven development? Whenever you are making changes to the code, you are refactoring. This means we understood, right? Refactoring always enhances agility. And this is called TDD, which is test driven development. So we came to the end of the video. Now it's a time to do 
the most important thing which is nothing but a cherry on the top practicing test questions so now i'm going to give you a question that will test your understanding on the concepts that we discussed right now in this particular video here we go on the screen on the right side you will be seeing four scenarios scenario one scenario two scenario three and scenario four on the left side you will be seeing four options technical depth refactoring test driven development and pad programming your task is very simple you have to do match the following this means in the comment section please mention which scenario is technical depth like gautam scenario one is technical depth scenario two is refactoring scenario three is pair programming scenario four is test driven development do the right match and put your answer on the comment section just don't write your answer please provide reasoning because i want to make sure that you have correctly understood the concepts and also in the comment section i will be revealing the right choices as well with my explanation and when you have understood things wrongly i will correct you in the comment section itself and my humble request please don't take this concept and this question very lighter as i said in the introduction there is a high probability you may find similar question in the actual pmp exam i hope you guys have enjoyed this particular video if it is yes just smash the like button and also in the comment section please do let me know what is the next content i should focus on thank you so much for staying with me such a long time and if you guys have any queries related to pmp or generic project management stuff you can reach out to me my email id is gautam.sudhakar@eduhubspot.com that you are seeing on the screen i will be also giving my linkedin description in the description of this particular video please be kind enough in sending the connection request let's stay connected and let's help our project management community so again i will be soon meeting you all in an another great video until then bye take care and all the best for your pmp exam prep